Well, thank you uh, for joining me on this Remembrance Sunday. Uh, today is such a, an important day, a day when we, when we pause, when we stop, when we uh, fall silent and, and we remember uh, those fallen in two world wars, those uh, in other wars and conflicts uh, that have died, uh, been injured, those who have laid down their lives for us, those who have gone into war and paid the ultimate price. And today with countless others around this country and around the world, we will remember our loved ones, family members and friends and all those who have given themselves. And today we honour those who have fallen. As Jesus himself said, greater love has no one than he lay down his life for his friends. And so this morning we're going to look uh, at a part of John's Gospel that I kind of jumped over uh, a few weeks ago because uh, I wanted to keep it for uh, Remembrance Sunday. Uh, and it's from John 12 verses 20 to 36 and I'm going to read this uh, for us today. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. So the background to these words is, is basically Palm Sunday. It's that uh, picture of Jesus on the foal of a donkey, on a little baby donkey, uh, heading uh, into Jerusalem and the crowd gathered waving palm branches, lay, laying them down on the path in front of Jesus, like that kind of royal welcome, crying out, you know, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Bible passage ends by saying that it was like the whole world was going after Jesus. This followed the raising of Lazarus from the dead and the word, if you like, was out. The man who had fed thousands of people from a packed lunch, the one who'd healed hundreds and hundreds of people, the one who spoke words that people said, you know, we've never heard words with such authority before. This same man had, you know, brought Lazarus back from the dead, this man who'd been dead for four days, and the crowd was getting bigger and bigger of people who were kind of sure that this must be the Messiah. Surely, if he's doing this, if he's saying this, he must be 
the Messiah. And it seems that, you know, as this passage begins, word had got to some Greeks that had come uh, to celebrate the Passover festival. And now they want to come and see Jesus and speak to him themselves. And we don't actually know whether they end up speaking with him or not. It doesn't look like they do. But we know that the arrival of these Greeks uh, was for whatever reason, the kind of final thing for Jesus, for him to then say, my hour has come, the time has come. You know, through John's gospel, he said that his time had not yet come. You know, at the turning of water into wine, he'd said it to uh, his mom in John 7, before the Passover festival, he'd said it in John 8, he said it to, uh, as a crowd, because they couldn't seize him, and he was talking about his hour hadn't yet come. But here, for whatever reason, at this particular moment, Jesus makes it clear that the time had now come, that it was time for him to die, to go to the cross and die for the sin of the world. Now, I don't know uh, about you. Let's have a little glass uh, of water here, so just have a little drink. Whether you uh, played conkers uh, as a child or uh, as, a, uh, as an adult, um, one of my great childhood memories is of playing conkers, um, but not just playing conkers, but the whole thing of getting in the car with my dad, going to this big park that was nearby with loads of conker trees, as we called them, and we would walk around, clearing leaves out of the way, trying to find the best conker uh, that we could uh, that we could get, and you know, one that the squirrels, there's always loads of squirrels as well, trying to find them, uh, one that the squirrels hadn't nibbled, uh, and we'd bring them back, this kind of big stash of them, and they'd go in the brown bag, and they'd go in a cupboard, uh, and they'd go hard, and then one day, it was virtually like, you know, someone would say, it's time, it's time, they're ready, it's ready. And uh, we take them to the shed and we put them in the vise and we drill a hole in them, we put string through. And without any safety goggles, I have to admit, um, we played conkers. And, uh, you know, it, 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 we did it. I was thinking back some, some time ago that we did it in the lounge with all the ornaments around and all kinds of things. And these conkers would fly off uh, when they got broke all over the place. I'm surprised we didn't break lots of different things. But... We used to do this thing that, you know, they'd start, maybe you did, they'd start as a wanna. Uh, and then if they won, they'd become a tour. Uh, and, uh, and then if a two beat another two, they, that would become a four. Uh, but if a four played a conquer that had, you know, become a 20, then if the four beat the 20, the four would become a 24. And so it was sometimes, you know, I remember writing 100 and something on a conquer, because basically as the shell came off, we would write on the white inside uh, what number we'd got up to and then scribble it out and write the next number. Uh, great, great fun uh, doing that with my, uh, my brothers. But one year, I remember keeping a conquer, uh, and it was quite a big conquer, and I thought, I'm going to plant this because I'd really like a conker tree in the back garden. Uh, didn't really think about the size that they grew to and all of that. Um, but I, you know, from a young age, I loved gardening and I'd got a little bit of the garden that was my own. And I remember going and I can remember where I planted it uh, in this garden. And then I watched and I remember going back the next week and the week after that and the week after that. And then I don't think I looked anymore because nothing was happening. It was, you know, totally, totally dead and gone, I thought. Um, but no, because next, the next year, I remember going down to, um, down to the garden and looking and seeing this stem that had come through, but there's no leaves on it. And I was thinking, oh, I wonder what that is, whether it's a self-sown thing or, or what. And then the leaves uh, over the coming weeks came out and there were these enormous conquer tree leaves. Uh, and I remember thinking, wow, I've got a conquer tree in my garden. Um, and I guess if that tree had stayed there uh, and it would be quite big today and I guess there'd be loads and loads of conkers on it and there might be children underneath fighting the squirrels away to pick up conkers to play 
probably with safety goggles on, uh, conquers. But, you know, what Jesus is saying here is that unless the seed dies, unless it goes into the ground, then there's no fruit. And Jesus is saying that about himself. Unless he dies, unless he goes into the ground, there'll be no way for these Greeks that have just come to see him, no way for the whole world to know God uh, for themselves. And you know, we remember uh, Remembrance Sunday with the symbol of a poppy. Uh, and that's because in 1915, after a, a cold and long winter in Flanders, in Belgium, in the months of April and May, which were very warm for that uh, time of year, in those fields where there was just utter devastation because of the war, the only thing that grew were poppies. And John McRae, a doctor serving there in Belgium, in Flanders, with the Canadian Armed Forces, was deeply inspired. He wrote the famous poem in Flanders Fields uh, in 1915. And that led in part to the poppy being chosen as the symbol of Remembrance Sunday. But those seeds had lay dormant in those fields. It's said, they reckon, that uh, a poppy seed, I don't know how they work it out, but a poppy seed can lay dormant for up to 100 years uh, in the ground until the right conditions come along for that seed to grow. And so in those fields there, you know, they lots of poppy seeds had lay dormant, I guess, for many years, but because of the shelling and the fighting and the devastation, out of all of that earth being moved, some seeds came to that place where they could grow, and suddenly the, trans the landscape was transformed into something very different. And Jesus is saying here that he is going like a seed into uh, into the mess, if you like. He's going to uh, take our sin upon himself and he's going to lay down his life for the whole world so that our lives can be transformed uh, by God. But that he knows that without his body dying, without it being buried in the ground, that there won't be this fruit that's needed for the world. He knows that only if he goes to the cross can the way for us to know Father God for ourselves be opened up? But it's said that as soon as Jesus knew that the time had come, that he said these words, he was deeply troubled because he knew what going to the cross, what dying for uh, our sin meant. And we see from the other Gospels in the way that they uh, have the account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus was, was overwhelmed by what lay ahead. In the garden, he, he asked his Father in heaven if there was another way that this could be done, but that he was committed to doing this, whatever. Uh, and we know that there was no other way, that the cross was the only way uh, that sin could be dealt with. And it says in verse 32 that only if he is lifted up, only if his, his body is nailed to the cross and the cross is lifted up and then it drops into that socket and the pain and the agony that Jesus would go through and that crucifixion is, only if he goes through that sacrifice can the way for us to know God be made uh, clear. You know, to go back to Palm Sunday, the palm-waving crowd, you know, they didn't expect the Messiah to die. They expected the Messiah to reign on earth forever. They expected the Son of Man, that picture from the book of Daniel, to bring the kingdom of God in, you know, in terms of an earthly kingdom and that the kingdom would never end. But, you know, Jesus had come to deal with the much deeper issue of sin, the issue that the Old Testament sacrifices had covered, but that they hadn't dealt with. The issue that uh, separates us from a holy God and that, you know, brings, sin brings judgment from God. And if we die in sin, then the Bible is clear that we will receive the judgment of God upon ourselves. That is why Jesus came. 
the Old Testament sacrifices looked ahead to one who would die as the perfect sacrifice for past, present and future. And the death of Jesus in our place is what that was all about. You know that conquer that I, there's a plane flying overhead if you can hear some noise, that conquer that I planted, you know, it took months in the ground to emerge. Jesus will die, he'll be planted if you like in a tomb, and for many hours, uh, as to days, it will look like nothing's happening. It will look like that's it, that's the end. But then suddenly, three days later, there would be this bursting forth and Jesus would be back from the dead. As, this, as the song, the hymn in Christ alone puts it, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. I love that picture in that hymn of bursting forth. And it's, it's very apt if you think about the seed in the ground bursting forth with life. Uh, and that kind of, in my case, that new conquer tree coming into being that... Jesus died on the cross, took our punishment, and the way that we know that sin had been paid for, that God was satisfied, the wrath of God had been satisfied, was because God raised Jesus back to life. That was kind of the real clear picture that what Jesus had said on the cross when he said it is finished is totally true. We had a Zoom prayer meeting, as we do each week, uh, on Thursday this last week, and it was fireworks night. So you can kind of imagine what was going on as we were uh, trying to pray, uh, uh, but above our homes in different places from time to time we'd have almighty kind of bangs going off uh, and fireworks. And I even had some right above where I was, and we don't normally, I'm not quite sure who was having fireworks this year, but there was a lot of bangs around. and. You know, I remember as a, as a child going to see fireworks displays that got louder and louder and louder and louder and bigger and bigger in the terms of the amount of fireworks going up. And when they finished, all you could hear was car alarms uh, because I guess the vibrations and the noise had just set all of these car alarms off. It was quite interesting just to, to see how many would be going off at the end of it. What we get here in verse 28 is Jesus speaking to his father and saying, Father, glorify your name. That was always his desire. And then a voice from heaven. His father replies, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And it says that the crowd that heard it said it thundered. Others said that an angel had spoken to him. And so when Jesus speaks about his death and all that he's going to do, that he's going to go through this for the glory of his Father. The Father speaks back to him from heaven of how he is glorifying God, how he is always glorifying God, if you like, and will bring glory to God. And Jesus continues by saying, you know, this voice was for your benefit, not for mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And it says, he said this, to show the kind of death that he was going to die. Jesus knew that the cross would be the most difficult part of his earthly mission. For all eternity, he'd lived as the uh, eternal son of of God. They, as a loving community, you know, God is love. They lived in love, in perfect love, in loving communion with each other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet, he's come to earth ultimately for this time that has now come to die. Jesus was going to become sin, to take our sin upon himself, knowing that his father hated sin, that his father would pour out his judgment upon him as he takes the sin of the world upon himself. And Jesus, therefore, you can see why he's troubled, because he knew something of the punishment that was heading his way 
for the sin of the world. And, you know, at his baptism, the father cried out from heaven, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. We get him saying words similar at the transfiguration of Jesus. But at the cross, as Jesus cries out, you know, where are you? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There'll be silence. There'll be separation. Why? Because of you and because of me. Because you wanted to glorify his Father and because you want us to live for that too, to glorify God. He wants us to, to follow him and to lead and live our lives that God might be glorified. Jesus had come to be the long-awaited Messiah, but he hadn't come with clubs or swords, but to be a perfect sacrifice for our sin. He'd, he'd not come to, to kind of take people to war, but to defeat the devil through his death on the cross. And as he did so, to to bring in his kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that's under the rule and reign of God, that through faith, anyone through the cross of Christ can become part of. And Jesus ends in this passage by saying, you know, walk in this light. Jesus knew his time on earth was coming to an end. He knew that temporarily the light would kind of look like it's gone out as he goes into the tomb would look like darkness had won. But he knew that, you know, three days later, he would be announced by angels to be risen from the dead, that he's not here, and that sin had been defeated, death had been defeated, the devil, the prince of the world had been defeated. Because the seed died, was buried in the ground, so we can have this bursting forth of life with God for the whole world if we receive it for ourselves. So as I finish, you know, Jesus went into the ground and it looked like he'd lost. It looked like, you know, those who'd rejected him, the Jewish leaders who'd condemned him, Judas Iscariot who'd betrayed him, the soldiers who'd mocked him, Pilate who'd sentenced him, basically these sinful people of the world, it looked like they had won. They, under the influence of the prince of the world, the devil, had defeated the Son of God. But what they didn't realise is that only if the Son of God was planted into the ground could great fruit come from that seed. Only through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ could the way to God be opened, could sin be paid for, and through faith could we enter into relationship with God. And to kind of complete the picture that's here, you know, the message of the Bible is that one day on the clouds, the Son of Man will return, will come back to reign forever, to bring the kingdoms of the world to an end, so that the judgment of God can take place. And the challenge is, are we trusting in the seed that came back from the dead and paid for our sin, the one who is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, or are we trusting in ourselves and therefore we will receive the consequences for our sin before a God who, when he speaks, thunders, is what some of these people said. You know, if you're a cricket fan, You'll know all about light meters and how when the light is failing, the umpires get the light meters out and check if there's enough light for the cricket match to continue. And the crowd waits and, you know, hopes that they'll carry on. But maybe it's too dangerous if the light isn't enough. Jesus says here, the light's only here for a little while longer. And you know, ultimately, we don't know when Jesus is going to come back again. We also don't know how many hours or days we have left on this earth before we die. So the challenge is before the light fades, before the game is brought to a close, the kind of life is brought to a close, I urge you to be reconciled to God, to accept what Jesus did on the cross for yourselves by faith and to enter into that light of being a child of God, of becoming part of his kingdom, his family. Jesus says, believe the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. 
So this Remembrance Sunday, as we remember those who've laid down their lives for us, as we remember and we think about poppies uh, and seeds dying and bursting forth into life on those Flanders fields, I pray that we too would remember the eternal God who sent forth his Son to die for us, who laid down his life for us so that we can for all eternity be friends, live in relationship with God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Remembrance Sunday. We re remember today all those who've laid down their lives in war or in service for us. And we say thank you for each and every one. And today we remember the one that you sent from heaven to earth, who willingly laid down his life on the cross for our sin. And we say thank you that he was willing to go through the agony of the cross, willing to bear our judgment for our sin so that we can become right with you. Lord, we give you all the glory and honour and praise. And may we walk in the light of you you are. And as we walk with you day by day, may you transform our lives, the landscape of our lives, to be more and more like you, as we head closer and closer to your eternal light in glory forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you uh, for uh, watching and uh, let's just say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.